And they made the decision to not re-erect the st statue today. So what ended up happening is there was a ceremony taking place where that statue was happening, or where, where the statue was going to be. And, um, and one of our younger relatives, or one of our relatives, um, was shot today by somebody wearing a MAGA hat. And it just happened within the last few hours. And um, luckily, um, the relative's name is J um, Jacob Johns. He's Hopi. Um, and luckily, it missed his, missed his heart and it missed his spine. Um, and he's stable right now in the hospital in New Mexico. Um, but we didn't want to jump right into the conversation we were going to have without acknowledging that this happened today in this country. And um, people from our team were on the ground there working with Three Sisters, working with Tewa Women United, working with the Red Nation, an Indian collective family who are all coming together for that resistance. And so um, before we get started, I want to share a prayer for our relative who's in the hospital, and at the same time to share a prayer for, for Leonard Paltier too. Ha tu gashala, a te wa kanta ka tu gashala. La ko we chung hanki lay tu gashala, wona ku a ka, wona ku a shte, na we chaku po tu gashala. I pray tu gashala that you watch over each and every one of us, that you watch over Jacob tu gashala. I pray for his healing. I pray and encourage for his healing and watch over him and his loved ones. He's a father too, and I ask you to watch over his children to Gashala. I pray to Gashala. I pray for there to be less hate in the world and more love, Creator. And I pray that you find a way, find a way for love and justice to prevail in the world, Creator, as we fight for it. And I make a special prayer tonight too to Gashala for Leonard Paltier and his cell. To watch over him. Could you help give him encourage, encouragement to make it for one more day, one more week, until we can get him out? And I thank all of you and everybody who has come before who has fought for Leonard's freedom, who has fought for indigenous people's rights, and those of us that are fighting now. And I thank you for bringing us together, Creator. Wopilatanka e chichiapalo. Midakoyase. Hi, everyone. We're going to start today off with two videos. Um, but I'm also wondering if folks could like congregate in the middle, if that's possible, just so we can kind of have this more sense of like wholeness as one. Um, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. I am everyone who ever died without a voice or a prayer or a hope or a chance. Everyone who ever suffered for being an Indian, for being human, for being indigenous, for being free, for being other. one of them, every single one, yes, even you, I am every one.
the United States government, led by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, led a war and a reign of terror against American Indian people in the 1970s. And they led a COINTELPRO strategy and ran a counterintelligence strategy to defuse the American Indian movement. They decided they were gonna choose a battleground to attack the American Indian movement. The Federal Bureau of Investigation and its counterintelligence program did not care about human rights. They did not care about the constitutional rights. They only cared about using its full power to disrupt a movement because they seen this movement and they seen the indigenous people's move and the American Indian movement as a threat because that movement was magnifying the injustices that happened to indigenous people. And we see that consistent with how they are treating indigenous people everywhere, how they have treated indigenous people throughout history and how they continue to treat indigenous people to this day. So Leonard Paltier's release, it would represent some form of acknowledgement that the United States in fact wage a war against the indigenous people of this continent, incarcerated one of our people for almost 50 years, and then came to a realization that that was wrong. Leonard has been held unjustly for 47 years. That's nearly five decades. We're creating a political moment to free Leonard Paltier. And we're on our way to Washington, D.C. to do a rally on his birthday, his 79th birthday, September 12th in front of the White House uh, to uh, call for, the, for Leonard Peltier's freedom. This today, this energy, this uh, culmination of all of that has come now to this moment. All of those who have come before us, all of those that have uh, fought for Leonard's freedom, all of those who have built and sacrificed to build the American Indian movement, uh, all of that has not been for nothing because as a next generation of young people, we're taking that on. And so this, this continued uh, momentum is this building. This is a pivotal point right now in history for his freedom. and imprisonment of Leonard Peltier. And we're calling for executive clemency for his release. We're here for Leonard Peltier, the longest uh, indigenous political prisoner. He's been in prison for, for decades. Leonard represents so many of us. You know, if it can happen to him, it can happen to us. And I think of my, my sons, I think of my brothers and my, my, my aunt day and my father. You know, so many of us are facing injustices every single day. Leonard is our relative and we're here to, to stand. We're here to make a stand and, you know, let the Biden administration know that they have a responsibility. They talked about, you know, upholding uh, and centering and prioritizing the, the rights and civil rights of Native American people. It was one of their priorities for this administration. And we're waiting to see that, you know, this is a time to show that this is a time of action. We're, we're asking them to do something and we're asking for them to do something now. We get the picture up, please. Hi, everyone. Imanaja Mashikuna, Nyuka Shutimi, Talia Yarina, Ecuador, Otavalo, Jactamanda, Yupaychani. Hi, everyone. My name is Talia Carol Kachimwell. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a student here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. It was one of my oldest memories, a cold and rainy day in November. I remember hearing the echo of Free Leonard Peltier chants reverberating throughout Plymouth Rock, Massachusetts. At the time, I was just four years old. 
I first learned about Leonard Peltier when I was a little girl, and I followed the ebbs and flows of this case throughout the trajectory of my entire life. My family and I attend the National Day of Mourning in Plymouth Rock, Massachusetts, hosted by the United American Indians of New England, which takes place on Thanksgiving Day. At each day of mourning, a statement from Leonard Peltier is read. From a young age, I could identify the pain that people felt when they heard Leonard's speech each year. As I got older and learned more about Leonard's case, I felt more of a reason to feel angry and confused. Between the numerous constitutional violations that took place throughout the course of Leonard Peltier's trial, the outright racism, his ongoing health concerns, and his fragile status as an elder, it's truly hard to fathom and grasp how we're all still here this evening. NDN Collective is a national indigenous-led organization dedicated to building indigenous power. Through organizing, activism, philanthropy, grant making, capacity building, and narrative change, NDN is creating sustainable solutions on indigenous terms. NDN Collective and Amnesty International recently hosted a Free Leonard Peltier 79th birthday action in Washington, D.C., which some of y'all just saw the clip from where hundreds of supporters and allies gathered in front of the White House on Leonard Peltier's 79th birthday. During this action, a 125-foot banner was unfurled that stated, President Biden, free Leonard Peltier now. As the banner was getting set up, I looked up and saw Nick Tilson's daughter, Shayla, who is now a fourth-generation Leonard Peltier activist, dancing in the middle of Pennsylvania Avenue with the Lambac flag used as a shawl, which is pictured up here. As I watched, I remembered being a teenager fighting for Leonard Peltier's freedom. And now I was watching with my own eyes the next generation continuing this fight. In that exact moment, I felt both pride and sadness. Like Shayla, I grew up fighting for Leonard Peltier. There are people who have been fighting for Leonard Peltier's freedom for 48 years. There are elders, aunties, uncles, there are teenagers and babies who have grown up in this fight. And there are people who have passed on who fought for Leonard Peltier. This fight has spanned too many generations. As a Quichua Tavalo Warmi desde el barrio Montserrat, Huachalado, I see my role in this fight as a person who works to uplift the eagle and the condor prophecy. The eagle and the condor prophecy is sacred. It represents the indigenous people of the north and the indigenous people of the south, that we reunite through knowledge, diversity, strength, self-determination, and revitalization. But before we get started today, I want to take a moment to acknowledge a special person in the room tonight, Beverly Smith, a dear comrade, family friend, activist, legend, and the list goes on, has played a central and formative role in the development of the uplifting aspect of our society today. Beverly Smith, alongside her twin sister Barbara, wrote and published one of the most important and significant black feminist texts to this day, the Combahee River Collective Statement. Beverly Smith is a role model and someone that I look up to as a visionary and a freedom fighter. And while we honor and make space for Leonard Peltier today, I also want to acknowledge the critical importance of black and indigenous liberation and solidarity as it's inherently tied to our collective liberation. Please join me in giving a round of applause for Beverly Smith. <laughs> On my first day of ethnic studies and education here at HGSE, Dr. V brought in Maya Angelou's quote, I come as one but stand as 10,000. This is exactly how I see us cultivating this space with you all today. We represent generations of indigenous resistance and generations of those of us who have fought for the freedom of Leonard Peltier and we will not stop until he's free. I want to take a moment to thank our co-sponsors of this event, the Harvard Graduate School of Education Student Law Society, the Harvard University Native American Program, the Quechua Initiative on Global Indigeneity, Amnesty International USA, and NDM Collective. Woo! 
It's now my pleasure to introduce our incredible set of speakers. Judge Kevin Sharp is co-vice chairman of Sanford Heisler Sharp and co-chair of the firm's public interest litigation group. Prior to joining the firm, Judge Sharp was nominated to the federal bench by President Barack Obama, confirmed unanimously by the Senate, and received his commission as a federal district court judge on May 3rd, 2011. Judge Sharp served on the U.S. District Court for the Middle District of Tennessee from May 2011 to April 2017, including service from 2014 to 2017 as the court's chief judge. Since serving on the federal bench, Judge Sharp has been involved in several projects related to criminal justice reform. In 2021, he helped secure executive clemency for Chris Young a young man who Judge Sharp was required to sentence to a life in prison due to draconian mandatory minimum sentencing laws. Judge Sharp is currently representing Leonard Peltier in his petition for executive clemency. He is an advisory board member to the Tennessee Innocence Project and the Nashville, Tennessee chapter of the American Constitution Society. Nick Tilson is the president and CEO of NDN Collective and a citizen of the Oglala Lakota Nation. Nick has over 20 years of experience building place-based innovations that have the ability to inform systems change solutions around climate resiliency, sustainable housing, and equitable community development. He founded NDN Collective to scale these place-based solutions while building needed philanthropic, social impact investment, capacity, and advocacy infrastructure geared towards building the collective power of indigenous peoples. Holly Cook Makaru is a nationally recognized expert on political strategy and advocacy centered on tribal legislative and policy issues at the federal level. Holly is a frequent speaker at national and international conferences and events and an on-air political contributor to the nation's largest leading tribal media outlet, Indian Country Today, where she provides political updates and commentary on tribal issues. Holly's background includes service as the director of the Office of Native American Affairs at the Democratic National Committee and in the White House of Intergovernmental Affairs. Holly has served as the national co-chair of the Native Vote Initiative at the National Congress of American Indians and in strategic and tribal outreach roles for numerous Senate and congressional candidates. Holly has also been a key tribal voice in advising Democratic presidential campaigns for over 20 years, helping to develop candidate policies on Indian country issues and providing political guidance regarding engagement with tribal governments and communities. Holly's views have been included in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the New Yorker, Politico, Forbes, the Minneapolis Star Tribune, Tribune, and other media. Holly is an enrolled citizen of the Red Lake Band of Ojibwe in northern Minnesota. Next, I would like to pass the mic to one of the board of directors from the Student Law Society at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, Erica Annabel Clark. Hi everyone, good evening. So on behalf of the Harvard Graduate School of Education Student Law Society, we want to welcome you both to Harvard and also to tonight's event. Um, my name is Erica Annabelle Clark and I'm an education policy and analysis student here at Harvard Graduate School of Education. And I know I speak for all of the event collaborators tonight when I say that we are truly grateful for your attendance tonight as we discuss advocacy and law because the nexus of them both really are, is really important. Your presence tonight reaffirms the power of collective action in addressing critical issues that are facing our society today. And the story that we gather here tonight to discuss is very, very important. The story of Leonard Peltier is an important story because his name has become synonymous with a quest for justice spanning nearly five decades. Leonard Peltier is an indigenous activist and a member of the AIM movement who has spent a majority of his life behind bars. 
Convicted in connection with the tragic events of the Pine Ridge Reservation in 1975, Leonard's case has raised significant concerns regarding justice, human rights, and reconciliation. And Leonard's fight for freedom is not his alone. It is a struggle that resonates with many of us who have dedicated themselves and ourselves to advocating for justice, equality, and the rights of marginalized and disenfranchised communities across the globe. So the question remains, what can we do? How can we contribute to this cause? Well, first, I offer that we can educate ourselves and others about the specifics of Peltier's case because understanding the details is crucial to advocating effectively. And then secondly, I say, we can engage in open and constructive dialogue with our communities, our representatives, and the institutions that contribute to these issues to raise awareness about this issue and many others like it. Third, we can support organizations and individuals who have tirelessly been working on Leonard's behalf, as well as indigenous rights, justice initiatives, and coalitions that exist and are already doing the work. And then lastly, we can push ourselves to push for transparency, accountability, and justice within our legal and judicial systems. We hope that tonight's event serves as a catalyst, inspiring us all to become active participants in the fight for justice. So once again, on behalf of the Harvard Graduate School of Education Student Law Society, we thank you guys for your presence and your commitment to this cause, and we hope that we can move forward together with determination, compassion, and a shared belief in the power of truth and justice. Thank you. Thank you. So we're gonna get started with our panel. Uh, we're going to start with our first question to Nick Tilson. Nick, can you give us a sense of what the atmosphere was like on Pine Ridge in the summer of 1975? Uh, sure. Can people, can people hear me? Sounds like a fishbowl up here. <laughs> um, uh, uh, it's Hampetu Washte, Nick Tilson, Amachapi, Chantea Washte, Napetu Zapolo. Good to see uh, each and every one of you. Um, I live in Porcupine. About three, about three and a half miles, or three miles from Wounded Knee. Um, my parents met at, wound, at the occupation at Wounded Knee in 1973. Um, and so I was raised up in the American Indian Movement and was raised up with my, with my family. And when we, when we reflect on, you know, between the eight years of 1968 and 1978 was, you know, the rise of the American Indian Movement and they changed the political conditions in that decade. Um, and the United States became very threatened by that. They became very threatened by what was happening. Um, and after the Trail of Broken Treaties to, to Washington, D.C., um, that's basically when the federal government decided that it was going to use Pine Ridge as the, as the, as the battleground to distinguish the American Indian Movement. And they made uh, Pine Ridge um, a militarized zone. And they brought in U.S. Marshals. They brought in um, the the FBI. They brought in, and this is this is before the shootout in Oglala, uh, and it was in it was in this climate that that shootout happened. Um, you know, there's between 50 and 60 you know unsolved murders during that time on Pine Ridge. It was in the midst of a of a civil war. Um, but one that was backed by the United States government and the FBI um, and the other that had, you know, eagle feathers and hunting rifles. And, uh, and so it was a dangerous time. It was one of the most dangerous places, you know, in the United States at that time. And there was also huge corporate interests that were descending upon the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and the surrounding areas for mineral development, uranium development, um, you know, we're sort of at the, the height of uh, the, the nuclear movement at the time. Um, and so there was a massive uh, extractive industries pushing, you know, uh, billions of dollars in trying to, uh, you know, extract the minerals from the community. And in that atmosphere, there was, everybody was in fear. Like, everybody was in fear. And... There was two sides. There was the sides of the American Indian Movement and the grassroots people, and then there was the side of, you know, the, the federal government, and at that time, the, the corrupt tribal government that was being backed by the federal government. And, um, and it was these conditions in which that shootout happened. 
you know, on the day of the shootout, there was about six different agencies within 20 minutes of that location of that shootout. Six different federal agencies that were there already. They've been there. They didn't leave after when did he? That's like 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 they you know you see all the the footage of the uh, that was shared up here. Um, that's all footage of Pine Ridge where they had APC vehicles and army tanks and all that stuff was in the community. That was happening. And after Wounded Knee ended, they didn't leave. They stayed there in the community. And so um, everybody was in fear. Everybody was armed. You know, everybody. And there was random shootings happening all the time. Um, and so when these two FBI agents rolled into a, you know, blazing into an aim, aim encampment, um, they knew exactly what they were doing. And, uh, and so, you know, th those are the conditions, you know, that was taking place at that time. And that being funded by the United States government, they wanted to create a situation where this movement would implode on itself by putting all this pressure and all this violence and creating a situation for our movement to implode on itself. They were doing it to the Black Panther Party. They were doing it to the La Raza movement. They were doing it to all of the movements at the time. They were doing it to the Civil Rights Movement. Um, and, um, and they were using taxpayer dollars to do it. And so you, you got to understand the political and social context of the time and of the era to actually truly understand what happened you know, on that day in Oglala in, you know, 1975. Thank you, Nick. Um, and I think jumping off of that question, we'll, we'll move over to Judge Sharp to provide more context on the case. Uh, thank you, Judge Sharp, for being here today. It's an honor to be sharing this space with you. Um, so you've been Leonard Peltier's attorney for nearly four years. And for folks in the audience who may be learning about Leonard Peltier for the first time, could you please provide a brief overview of the case? Yeah, thank you. And thanks for, for having us all here to talk about this really important issue. And I came at it from a different perspective. The things that Nick talked about um, were, is what I've been learning over the last four years. So I came at this as a former federal judge, and I was asked to look at this file that I knew nothing about. I didn't know anything about the history that Nick is giving, although as you listen to it, it starts to sound a lot like Vietnam. Um, I just looked at it from a trial transcript, court documents, um, FOIA release, Freedom of Information Act documents, and what I saw was a trial and an investigation that was riddled with misconduct, um, constitutional violation, threats and intimidation against, against witnesses as they put this case together. That's what I saw. And so when the shootout happens, and there were three people killed that day, Joe Stunts, a Native American, I, I call him a kid, I apologize for anyone who's 21 years old. You don't think of yourself as a kid, but when you get to be 60, I think of that as a kid. <laughs> and there's Joe, and nobody talks about Joe Stunt. But we do talk about the two agents. We ought to talk, be talking about all three of them because what happened there was a tragedy for everyone and all of the families. But someone, two FBI agents, and that's the government's perspective, were dead. Somebody had to pay for that. And there were three outsiders. They were not part of, of the nations whose land they were on. They were, but they were AIM members, and those were going to be the three who were going to be tried for murder of the two agents. Now, they end up being tried separately. There were, the three were Leonard Peltier, um, uh, a guy named Butler, and a guy named Robideau. Robideau and Butler are tried separately. And they are tried in front of a particular judge who was as fair as you could be, let in evidence of things that Nick just talked about, right? Because it all context matters. Um, he let in evidence of the threats and the intimidation that the courts have recognized since and explain why this started. No, these two agents were um, in plain clothes, in unmarked cars. They came onto um, the Pine Ridge and Jumping Bull Ranch. No one knew who they were. What you knew was the atmosphere that Nick described. A gunfight was going to happen. 
This place was a powder keg, and it did happen, and somebody was going to get tried for that because Leonard has um, gone to Canada. He didn't believe, rightfully so, that he could get a fair trial here. Robert Owen Butler tried separately. All of this information comes in, all the evidence comes in, and they're acquitted based on self-defense. So now all you've got is Leonard Peltier, who is in Canada, and the Canadian government will not extradite him because there's no evidence that he murdered anybody, and that was the charge. What they did, they had to get him back, is they got a woman named Myrtle Porbear to sign several affidavits that were all contradictory. But ultimately, they presented one to the Canadian court, and she said, I'm Leonard's girlfriend. I was there that day. I saw Leonard murder these two agents. Turns out Canada extradites him, and it turns out Myrtle Poor Bear wasn't there, was not Leonard's girlfriend, and never met Leonard Peltier. But there's no, under the, under the extradition treaties, um, there's no remedy for that. If you lie to get someone back, commit perjury, a fraud on the court is clearly what it is. There's no remedy. They've got him now, and they're going to try him, but they don't like the judge they've got, so they get a different judge. Now the case has moved to, to Fargo, North Dakota, Makes no sense. I can't find any records on why that's done, who allowed that to happen, but it's tried in Fargo with a different judge who keeps out all of the context evidence and keeps out that the two co-defendants were acquitted. Now, he doesn't let in any evidence about Myrtle Poor Bear being threatened and intimidated. In fact, they, what they told her was if she didn't sign that affidavit, they were going to take her child away from her, which we know uh, based on the, our boarding school history, they will do it. And so she had a real reason to be fearful when she signed this affidavit. The judge doesn't let that in. He doesn't let in the evidence that three, uh, there were three teenage boys that testified um, initially as part, of the, as part of the grand jury indictment that they had seen Leonard do things that he had not done. They saw Leonard with weapons that he did not have. They were all threatened. By the time Leonard's tried, we know that. The judge doesn't let that evidence in. And most importantly, so they're trying Leonard as, as the, the trigger man. He is the principal um, defendant who has murdered two agents. They have one piece of evidence, a shell case. And the ballistics agent gets on the stand, an expert, and he says, well, if we had a firing pen test, that would tell us which weapon it was. All we have is a shell casing. It's the same shell casing that comes from the type of weapon that someone reported Leonard Peltier had. And basically, that's their argument. Here's a shell casing. Leonard was seen with that type of weapon. That's it. This is their, this is their case. Mm -hmm. Turns out, though, they had done a firing pen test. And they had done it about four, five, six months before the trial, and they knew it wasn't his weapon. But they hit it. And they tried him on the shell casing, and he is convicted of murder, of being the principal shooter. Now, through a FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act request, this document shows up years and years later. So what the government says is, well, okay, if, if he is tried for aiding and abetting, which they could convict him on, someone killed these agents, then we don't, need the, we don't need the ballistics test that shows it was him. We don't claim it was him. And in fact, what they say, said then and say today is we don't know who shot the agents. Um, and what they say today and said shortly after that was our evidence against Leonard Peltier was sketchy. That's a quote from the assistant U.S. attorney who tried the case. That same U.S. attorney assistant U.S. attorney later said, our theory was that Leonard shot these two agents. We didn't prove that. We knew we hadn't proven that. Yet here we are 48 years later on a case that was created on a foundation of constitutional violations, of threats and intimidations against witnesses, of hidden ballistics tests. It's, it's called Brady evidence. It's evidence that tends to show someone didn't commit the crime. And because he didn't get in evidence that his co-defendants were acquitted based on self-defense. They didn't have to say who he aided and abetted. Can't aid and abet someone who was found not guilty by reason of self-defense. There was no crime. So you've aided and abetted a crime that didn't happen. And so all of that, I'm looking at this from the standpoint of a former judge who's tried a lot of criminal cases and just thinking, what in the hell 
is going on here. This is not the Constitution that I learned about in law school. It's not the Constitution that I applied when I was sitting on the bench. It's not the Constitution that applies to the rest of us, particularly. And I, I sat on the bench watching a lot of, of African-American, young African-American men coming through. It's not the Constitution that applied to people who were not Native Americans, not the Constitution um, you know, that applies to those with privilege. And that's what, kind of in a nutshell, sorry, it took me a little over time, but in, a, in my nutshell, that's Leonard Peltier's case, and that's what keeps me so worked up about this and, and, yeah. and churning about this because I've taken an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States three times in my life. I was in the military, I became a lawyer, and when I took the federal bench, I know what it means. And what burns me up about it is they took it too. The guys that tried him swore to support and defend that same Constitution, and they threw it away because... Leonard Peltier was, was part of a, of a movement that the government found subversive, um, and he didn't look like them, right? He's, he's different. He is something less than uh, the people who apply those laws. And so that's, that's Leonard's case, and you know, that's why I'm here. It's taken me, didn't take me long to figure out the what happened, but the why has, has taken me four years and I will still always struggle, I think, to understand the why. Yeah. Thank you, Judge Sharp and Nick. I think they both provided a, um, an extremely insightful overview of this case and I hope that for folks that are learning about Leonard tonight, you can understand why, why we're here now and why this is so important and why it's important that you guys are also here supporting us in this work um, because it's been 48 years too long. I'm going to switch over to asking Holly Cook Makaru a question. Holly, you are a nationally recognized tribal advocate who leads the federal strategy and outreach related to Leonard Peltier's executive clemency campaign. Could you please provide an overview of what it will take to bring Leonard Peltier home and the political advocacy work that has taken place throughout the course of the past two years? Yes. Thank you, Talia. Ani and Buju, Baganikish Go Kwe and Dijanakaz, Makwa Nindo Dem, Meskwagami Wizagaganing, and Donjaba. My name in Ojibwe is Hole in the Sky Woman. I'm from the Red Lake Band of Ojibwe in northern Minnesota, and I'm from the Bear Clan. My English name is Holly Cook Makaro, and I lead this effort in combination with Talia who is so graciously hosted and invited us all here this evening. Um, and of course with Judge Sharp, and it was Nick Tilson who brought me to this work almost two years ago. And um, I, I saw the look on some of your faces as, as Nick gave the outline of what was happening on Pine Ridge in 1975 and the facts of the case that Judge Sharp laid out. And the last two years have been a learning process for me and because I grew up in northern Minnesota, that's where my reservation is at. It is the home place, the, the AIM was founded in, in Minneapolis. Um, the leadership of AIM was from my neck of the woods, from Leech Lake, from White Earth, the Bell Courts, the Means were always around even though they were from the Dakotas. And um, I, was, I was familiar with the story, but I wasn't familiar with the facts. And that is what is so important. And as I did the research and began to do the advocacy work and really just learn more about this case, it, 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 and I've said this before, it became about justice for me because of all it represented. Nick outlined you know, that momentous decade between 1968 and 1978. That was like to the African American community that was the civil rights movement for in Indian country that is the most important civil rights era for us. It was an era of activism that we've never seen again. It was a time that led us to the table and the creation and passage of foundational legislation like the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act that much of 
what we advocate and stand on today, land under trust, um, the authorization and funding for, for, for so many tribal programs are enshrined in legislation that was passed in the 1970s in that decade. And so in answer to your question about what it's going to take to free Leonard now, one is public education. And, and again, you know, seeing the looks on your faces and for anyone watching online, these facts are not out there. We, they've not been shared. There's this, there's this perception that there is a gray area about, you know, did Leonard do it? But the FBI has admitted they cannot prove that Leonard committed a crime on the Jumping Bull Ranch that day. In the 2009, the hearing officer um, at his parole hearing, he's up for parole again next year. Hopefully, we will have him out before that. But they essentially said, well, we can't prove it, but someone did it. And we've got Leonard here, so you know, any Indian will do, right? Someone's going to pay for this. So the level of, we, of public education is one reason why we're here. And we need to turn that public education into public pressure on our elected officials and on President Biden. We turn that, elected, that, that pressure into, into an opportunity and, and really frame it as an opportunity for President Biden to do the right thing. Um, as Nick has said, to you know, rectify an injustice that has long represented injustice in our tribal communities for nearly five decades. What we are doing right now in terms of the advocacy and how we get there is, is putting together, and it's, it's been, you saw the action that we did in DC two weeks ago. We were very intentional about a message about the speakers. It was elected tribal leadership. It's, we tried to make sure that that messaging, that tone, the presentation, that it, it, it came from a place that was going to be impactful to the elected tribal leadership and to the president, because I, I've been doing this work in Washington, D.C. for over 25 years, and that is, I know that's who these elected officials pay attention to. We have Congressman Raul Grijalva. He's a Democrat from Arizona. He's chaired the Natural Resources Committee. He's been a tremendous advocate, not only for the tribes of Arizona, but for the tribes all over Indian country. In fact, the tribes in his own state say he sometimes works a little too hard for all of Indian country and not just them. The, um, um, he is leading a letter. Once again, he's led, he's led several letters, but he's, he is really a, a, such a huge champion for us, and a letter that will once again go to President Biden and asking him to grant clemency or to approve of a petition for compassionate release. And then last December, we had a letter from seven United States senators. We were very, very targeted about those senators. The president was a senator for a lot longer than he was the president. That's where his relationships are. He was very close to some of them. And um, so we had a letter from seven of those he was closest to. We have another letter coming from some very influential voices. We'll be seeing that. We also have a letter coming from tribal leadership from all over the country. And those voices. And so we're at a point now where we've got the Democratic National Committee, so the Democratic Party, of which the president is a member, members of Congress, members of the Senate, tribal leadership from around the country, all urging him to grant clemency, to free Leonard Peltier. And we have not had a response from the White House. Not one response. They won't meet. They won't, they, they won't comment on this. And it is imperative that we let the president know the sort of opportunity that is in front of him and the opportunity that he has in freeing Leonard to send a message to Indian country that there is a recognition of the injustice that has taken place and the symbolism that Leonard Peltier has held for, for nearly three generations of Indian people. And doing all of that is, is how we're going to get there, putting those pieces together. Um, th there's so many moving parts to this, but I will save that for the next question. Thank you, Holly, um, for providing that overview and the, yes, round of applause. <laughs>
Um, and the four of us have, have been in Washington, D.C. together lobbying and meeting with Senate and congressional offices on behalf of Leonard. Um, so I think it's really important to also understand like how critical this political advocacy is while we're also simultaneously working on the ground to bring public pressure to this cause. I'm going to bring it back to Nick with a two-part question. Um, could you please provide a brief overview of NDN Collective and how the work of NDN Collective is supporting the fight to free Leonard Peltier? In addition, you have a family history of advocacy and activism, not only in support of Leonard Peltier, but across Indian country. Can you tell us about your experience as a third generation activist in this effort? Yeah, sure. Um, so I founded, I founded Indian Collective in 2018. Um, based out of work that I was doing in my home community on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, uh, creating uh, affordable housing, creating solutions. We were a bunch of ragtag crew from the, the res trying to build sustainable communities and, um, and kind of learned how to do it in the process. And, um, and then we, we, we engaged as organizers in the Dakota Access Pipeline fight and sort of watched the the climate and environmental movement descend in my territory with their resources and their infrastructure. And then I watched them all leave. And I watched us lose that fight. And my first thought was, well, what if we had the movement infrastructure for indigenous people? Um, that every time, whether we won or lost fights, we got stronger each time. And we sustained our movements. And so Indian Collective is, a, is an international organization that does advocacy, that does grant making, that does community development, that does lending, um, all for the purpose of building indigenous power. We only support, in, uh, uh, support indigenous-led um, efforts that are led by the people impacted by the problems that we're trying to solve. And so, you know, that's Indian Collective. And, and, the, and the, the goal, you know, is, is that in order to create movement moments, you have to change the conditions in which we organize from the ground up, from the grassroots. And so Ending Collective has begun to do that and begin to resource. And it comes from this, you know, this ideology that um, many indigenous communities already have the solutions in, their, in those communities. They already have the culture and spiritual power, the lived experience, but they need to be resourced. And their self-determination needs to be resourced. So Ending Collective is a vehicle you know, in a toolbox to invest into indigenous self-determination. Um, and um, it was like a natural thing, you know. I mean, we, 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 have a, a, we have an advocacy arm of Indian Collective. We have a direct action arm, a creative resistance arm of Indian Collective. Um, and myself, like, I guess to the second part of the question is like, my grandfather, Ken Tilson, was one of Leonard's original attorneys. Uh, and in fact, after, after, after Wounded Knee, um, there was something established called the Wounded Knee Legal Defense Committee. And the Wounded Knee Legal Defense Committee was basically the movement's law firm <laughs> at the time uh, because hundreds of people, hundreds of people were going to jail after Wounded Knee. And that's the other thing about the climate that Leonard was, uh, you know, arrested in. I mean, at that time, almost every single leader of the American Indian movement was facing charges, was incarcerated, or, you know, uh, was, in, was in court. Um, the matriarchs were in court. The grandmas were in court. The grandpas were in court. They were taking everybody to court. It was, it was, it was the, the tying up the movement in, um, in court was part of the COINTELPRO strategy. Um, and so my grandpa and my family were heavily involved in supporting the American Indian movement and getting, getting folks out. Uh, and, and they were really successful uh, at, at getting a vast majority of people out of, out of prison and, out of, and keeping folks out of jail. And so naturally, like, I grew up in that environment. And so I grew up in this, you know, since I was, since I was you know, in diapers, going to Leonard Paltier's rallies, hearing about this case. And so when we started to build, um, you know, Indian Collective, um, people started saying, like, what are we going to do about Leonard? And we said, well, let's, let's apply 
some of this infrastructure that we have built to supporting the cause for Leonard. Let's try to mobilize the base that we begin to build and the movement that we've been able to be, begin to, to begin to sustain. Um, and Indian Collective has a philosophy around like we're frontline activists and frontline organizers, but we need to close the gap between the frontline uh, and, and the and, and the halls of a policy where decisions are made over the lives and lands of indigenous people. And I was like, well, that is some shit I don't know about. <laughs> so I'm going to find somebody uh, to help close that gap. Because I, I come from grassroots, you know, grassroots organizing, straight out of the, straight out of the res kind of thing. Um, and so i uh, been able to close that gap and come with strategy because the important part about Leonard's the fight for Leonard's freedom is for what it means for so many people. It is a symbolism of the, in, of the injustice that has happened to in Indian people over and over. Um, Judge Sharp might be surprised about what he was finding. We were not surprised <laughs> because it is the reality of almost every Indian people, any Indian person. Most promises have been made. Most times that there's been an opportunity to look at the Constitution of the United States, it has not went in our favor, even if it violated the Constitution of the United States. And so we've been mobilizing our infrastructure. So you, when you see like those videos of this protest that we did, we actually started this, we actually started this, this um, caravan at the Jumping Bull compound where the shooting happened. And we went there and we did a ceremony there. We loaded our chanupas there. We made prayers there. And we kept those loaded all the way to Washington, D.C. Because we, under this, we understand this to be a spiritual battle, too. We understand this to be uh, us fighting against, you know, the powers that be in the world. And, um, and at the same time that was happening, we had all of these awesome people from our creative resistance team and artists painting these banners. And our tactical media team you know, capturing these images and capturing the story, you know, and so all these moving parts in order to, you know, to, to build and maintain the momentum and build the movement and connect it to policy so that this work that we're doing is seen out there by the folks that we're trying to talk to. And so Indian Collective has been using the infrastructure that has been built. We've also made it very clear. One of our principles as organizers is we are accountable to our people. So we are accountable to Leonard, this team that sits up here. We talk to Leonard directly, not through third parties. I talked to him last night, you know. Um, he's called some of us today. We let him know what we're advocating because he's, he's been isolated from the people for 48 years. And, um, and it's important that he feels, uh, he has to know that people are fighting for him in order for him to keep moving forward. And so that's the other important part about this work is we're not just out here advocating and he doesn't know about what we're doing. We're in constant communication with him. And, that, and that's empowering to him because there's been times where that hasn't been the case, mm -hmm. where sometimes people are advocating and there's all this stuff happening and people are not communicating with him too. And so we've been trying to close that, that gap and, and roll forward in a very principled, principled way too. Thank you, Nick. I think that Nick raises a really important point there about how important it is for to make sure that Leonard's voice is centered and that we center his needs and empower him. Judge Sharp, in regard to Leonard Peltier's case, what have you seen change in the past couple of years and what do you expect as we enter 2024? You know, it, that's a really good question and it really... The answer just follows what Holly and Nick have been talking about. Because, um, you know, Nick says, I'm just learning about it, uh, but they've been living it. Um, and in some ways, I find that embarrassing for me that I didn't know more about it. Um, it's, a, it's a history that's not taught. If you didn't live it, you know, it's so far removed and, and in a lot of ways intentionally so from what we're taught in school. Um, and so then I've, I've been learning about this over the last four years, and I end up, you know, I think about it, they live it, 
And I wake up every day with the same look that y'all have got of, what in the hell? How did this happen in this country? Um, but it's because it was not my experience. Um, and it's not taught. But I think that that is changing um, for several different reasons, right? I think um, that the mainstream of America um, is, is waking up to treaty rights and the violations of those rights. It's something that people talk about and recognize. Um, the boarding school issues, right? I thought, I knew that such a thing existed, but I thought this was some kind of relic of the 1800s. I didn't realize it's, in, I think the last ones were kind of closed in the 1980s maybe, right? This is, this is current history, not ancient history. And mainstream uh, America is waking up to that and realizing what happened. I think Standing Rock was huge because that was on the news and, and in a way that Vietnam kind of the nightly news brought that into your lives. I know a lot of people are too young to remember that, but I remember as a kid, you'd watch the nightly news and they'd give you body counts and tell you what hill we took and what hill we lost and those kind of things. And it brought the war into your home, but only to a limited extent. Now with the way that news organizations work, we all got to really see what was happening and realizing, uh, Again, people waking up to what's going on with these multinational corporations that are wanting to drill and where do they want to drill? And it's one of the things Nick mentioned that, um, you know, this was this in the 1970s. This was as things usually are. This is about money and land. And why do we care? Because there's oil, because there's uranium, right? Because there's money. But people are waking up to that. And I think that's what's changed now. The story is the same. Leonard's story, at least by the 1980s, we knew what the government had done to convict him. But the audience wasn't ready to hear it. And I think that's what's changed is an audience that's ready to not only hear it, but now acknowledge that, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe that did happen. Maybe the federal government is capable of doing those things that we've been hearing about that nobody really wanted to believe. And, back to Holly's point, the politics have changed, right? The number of Native American voters in the grand scheme of things are small in, in a country with hundreds of millions of people, um, except that the Electoral College, the, the races, the White House is going to be won or lost through Indian country. That's why it matters, and that's what's changed, right? You don't win the, the White House without Wisconsin. Now these states are in play. Arizona, Nevada, Michigan, states that everybody just went, that's red, that's blue. Move on, let's go, let's go look at Ohio or some other what they call battleground states. Now they're all battleground states, and they're, they run right through Indian country. And so now the votes that they could ignore... Well, they run right through us. <laughs> right, right, right over you, right, right over you. Uh, now the votes that you could ignore because they weren't going to change elections now are going to be exactly what changes an election. And that's what changes. What's the White House's constituency? The FBI still opposes this. And they're really the last holdout. The U.S. attorney who was on the case has abandoned it and said, we never could prove that Leonard Peltier committed any crime out there, and he supports clemency. The judge that ultimately upheld the conviction on this cockamamie aiding and abetting theory came out before he died and said, it's time. Enough is enough. We need to end this. What That system of justice is a relic of the past. In fact... I didn't mention this before, but one of the jurors in Leonard's case on day two of the trial admitted that she was prejudiced. In her words, I'm prejudiced against Indians. Because the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution says you get a fair and impartial jury. And Leonard on day two was told your jury will be neither fair nor impartial. And they went, well, that's okay. Let's keep going. Right? That can't, that wouldn't happen today. They would overturn that. And he would get a new trial based on that alone. He'd get a new trial based on the Brady evidence, the hidden evidence. He'd get a new trial because you've got witnesses. The, the entire indictment was based on perjured testimony. Your ballistics expert perjured himself when he said, sure wish we could have done a firing pin test. 
when in fact they had done one and his signature was on the page. The other thing, and and I'll end this, wrap this up here. When Nick mentioned um, the, uh, the tactic of keeping everybody involved and anyone who was associated with AIM, they were gonna keep them occupied by keeping them embroiled in litigation, keep filing against them, keep bringing charges, even though they're, they know they're not gonna hold up and they're gonna drop them. Those kind of things and the stuff that I'm talking about, this is not speculation, right? All of this, there's an FBI memo that specifically says, here's what we're going to do. All of this is documented. If nothing else, the FBI w- will write a memo, even, even to their improper conduct. Um, the, US, the, the assistant U.S. attorney who um, uh, got the affidavit signed by Myrtle Poorbear uh, told the Canadian court, I'm as shocked as anybody that this affidavit is a lie, and he called them her FBI handlers are the ones who, who controlled this. But there are documents. There's always documents. There are documents that shows that that assistant U.S. attorney was directly involved in that affidavit. None of this is... Kevin, Nick, Holly sitting up here going, I think this is what happened, or, you know, we're kind of putting these pieces together, and here's my speculation. It's all been proven or admitted. How do I know he's innocent? Because the guys that prosecuted him tell me he's innocent. They tell me they couldn't, that was their theory, they couldn't prove the case. They tell me their evidence was sketchy. They tell me they don't know who killed the agents. And why are we still here? We're still here for all those reasons that that Nick and Holly are talking about that they've been living. So anyway, I think the climate has changed, the audience has changed, our president has changed. Great point. Thank you, Judge Sharp. And I think it's very reaffirming to kind of get a sense of some of all of your reactions as we, we hear this story. Um, well, you know, Judge Sharp and Nick and Holly outline a lot of the misconduct that took place during this trial, but also how important it is for us to acknowledge how the past informs our present and informs the moment that we're in right now. So, Holly, last November um, in 2022, President Biden took the stage and addressed the White House Tribal Nations Summit. During that time, President Biden delivered remarks to leaders all throughout Indian country, yet didn't mention Leonard Peltier. Politico reported on the summit, and their headline stated, the man missing from Biden's remarks. Referring directly to his silence on Leonard Peltier. What could clemency for Leonard Peltier mean for Biden as a president of the United States and his legacy? And when I saw that headline that day, uh, we may or may not have had something to do with that, but the um, having, and I had worked in the White House, right? And I thought, oh God, they're all gonna kill me. But I thought, great. (laughs) And because that that was the main political coverage of their biggest tribal event in 2023 and like I said we've made this noise we are doing we are checking the boxes to have that impact on this president and this is a president who rightfully so claims this entire administration is the best one in history for Indian country it began with the appointment of Deb Holland as the assistant secretary, as, as a, not assistant whoa, secretary. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> whoa. I just, I just relegated, yes. I just uh, demoted her to assistant secretary. She's uh, as the secretary of the interior. Well, you know, and because that used to be our top, elect, top official, right? The assistant secretary of Indian affairs. That has always been our, our top official at interior. But so with the appointment of Deb Holland and all that comes with it, right, with the leadership that we see coming out of the Department of Interior. But there's also the highest number of Senate-confirmed appointees throughout this administration. And on, the, on a daily basis, it, it doesn't, these are, these are jobs that don't make headlines, but these are the things when, when tribal leaders have issues and when there are funding and policy issues and things that matter on the ground in Indian country, those appointments, those Senate confirmed appointments throughout the administration from ag to energy to commerce to treasury, the United States treasurer who signs our currency is a member of the Mohican nation. And all of that, 
All of that matters. And so this claim to be the best administration is true. But we are also going into, I mean, this era of politics that we're all living right now is, is so beyond what I ever thought I would be doing when I went into politics, right? I mean, it, when, when, when Bush beat Gore, I thought that was the worst thing that could ever happen, right? And now it's like, gosh, those were the golden days. Um, but just be, and, and partly it's because, you know, the level of discourse has fallen so much. But Wait, did Bush beat Gore? <laughs> well, no, the Supreme, yeah. <laughs> and the, uh, the Supreme Court decided that one. <laughs> and the, uh, as we look at 2024, and, and Kevin started laying some of that out about how this race is going to be won, there are very few battleground states left in this country. And s several of them are going to be won with single digit margins. And the ones that are the most important as we look at 2024. I would say Arizona is the top one for a number of reasons. One, because it's a battleground state for the president. It's also a battleground state for the Senate. Another one is Montana. And John Tester has been elected three times. No one knows better where in the Indian vote is in the state of Montana than John Tester because it's gotten him across the finish line every single one of his elections. And no president wants to have a Congress that is made up entirely of the opposition party. And so those Senate races are important in Wisconsin and Minnesota, in Arizona. It, those all have native votes that are going to matter. And this is why I, I want to say to all the tribal leaders out there as well, it is so important to put your name behind this effort. And I know some folks say, well, you know, why should we do that? Or, you know, there are things that are more important. Well. You know, as a woman, I can attest that we can do more than one thing at a time. Yeah. We can multitask. We can, we can advocate for multiple issues. And really doing, um, and it, adding to what I, what I often say is a tipping point. Kevin outlined that every level of the prosecution, and I, I, all of these people are getting older. Gerald Haney has passed away. but. James Reynolds, the, pro the U.S. attorney whose office handled um, the prosecution and appeal, he has stepped forward and urged clemency as attested to the racism, the misconduct that took place. We have FB two FBI agents who have stepped forward and again attested to the racism and misconduct that took place. You know, and I, I, I equate it to a story that made headlines a couple of weeks ago. It was the Secret Service agent who rode on, on, on the car of President Kennedy's car when he was shot. He was, I think, 92. And there was a reference in there to, you know, there are folks who are involved in these, in these cases, these moments in history, and as they get older, they have this crisis of conscience. And they want to correct the record about their role, about what happened, and, and make those statements. And I think that's what we're seeing. We are at a tipping point. Everyone has stepped forward. Tri and tribal leaders also need to step forward. We've got members, we've got all of this coming together. So this impact on President Biden's legacy, I think is going to happen. And we're going, we are gonna work very hard to make sure that this is an issue in the 2024 election, that the opportunity to free Leonard Peltier, the legal avenues have been exhausted. The opportunity, the, the authority for clemency lies solely with President Biden. There is a role for the Department of Justice through the, through the pardon office, but it's going to go to White House counsel. That is a very closed process. We often see, you know, some remarkable pardons on the last day of an administration. This one is about justice, and it's going to mean something for Indian country as we go into 2024. There's an administrative process through a compassionate release. We will take whatever it is that brings Leonard home for the remaining years of his life. Thank you, Holly, for providing that context. So I'm going to ask Nick our last question, and then we'll open up the space for a question and answer. So if folks have some questions to get start getting those ready. Nick, what does freedom for Leonard Peltier mean to Indian country? 
I kind of touched on this earlier. I mean, I think that every promise that's ever been made to our people has been broken. Every single treaty that's ever been made has been violated. And those broken promises contribute to our struggle today. They contribute to the conditions that we live in. In my community, uh, the life expectancy of a male is 48 years old. I'm 41. And these conditions that we live in throughout Indian country aren't just, you know, um, an accident. They've been designed that way through the system. They've been intentionally designed that way. And Leonard Peltier's trial, his the day, from the day of the shootout all the way to, to the fact that him being an elder sitting in maximum security prison today for aiding and abetting <laughs> right, right. is outrageous. And, and I think that like this country has to have a reckoning with itself. It has to, the, the mirror has to be held up to this country. And Leonard's case is one of the things that can do it. I mean, it's one, it's one of the things that we talk about in, in the land back movement, which is about the movement to return indigenous lands back into indigenous hands. Part of the goal of that movement is to hold the mirror up to society and saying there, there would not be the United States of America. There would not be a constitution if it wasn't for the indigenous people of this land. And the fact that we're sitting here in the 21st century and the longest living political prisoner in American history is indigenous. And so this is a big moment. This, is a, th this would mean something to Indian people everywhere. And, um, and at a time in this country where it's ripe for us to have this country, because I think that when this country's at a crossroads, I think, that, I think that this country is heading into a direction of crossroads. I mean, you've seen it, right? You know, earlier today, one of our relatives on the front line was shot today. Today. You know, from somebody that was a QAnon, MAGA-wearing person. All because we were fighting against colonialism. You know? And so we are at this critical moment. And that's why, you know, that's what this could really mean for Indian country. I don't think that, you know, solving our, him coming home is going to wave a magic wand and the injustices that I've done to indigenous people are going to magically go away. But it is about accountability. It is about the people holding this country accountable to what it has done to indigenous people. And that's why it's so imperative that we fight for Leonard Peltier's freedom. And I want to say this too. He's just another human being. He's a grandfather. He's a, he's a grandfather. He's a father. He's a relative. And he sacrificed to build the American Indian movement that changed the political conditions in which Indian country has benefited from. But he has never been able to reap the benefits of the political conditions that um, he contributed to creating. And so that's what it could mean for Indian country. Um, and I think that's why it's, it's time right now, you know. And I, and I think that this crew and people throughout the country, like, I don't, we ain't stopping until we bring him home. <laughs> we, ain't stop, we ain't stopping until we bring Leonard home. And, uh, and I mentioned this when we stopped in Minneapolis on the caravan on the way to Washington, D.C. You know, a lot of times in Western society, there's a saying like, well, I'll believe it when I see it. But in like indigenous ways, when you believe it is when you'll see it. And I think that there's, you know, I think that, that that's an important um, aspect to, to the struggle at this time. Because we have to do that while we're fighting for it. You can't have, you have to do, you gotta, you gotta, gotta meet the creator halfway and I feel like all the work that we're doing is, 
that's where it's leading us to. So. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> Try not to burst out into tears at the moment, but um, <clears throat> before we move into q and I just also want to take a moment to thank you all for being here tonight. Like, you are a part of this with us, and, and you being here is a way of, of being in solidarity with us in this fight um, and to the people watching online as well. We're, we're live on NDN Collective social media platforms. Um, thank you for tuning in to us as well. Um, we have a few minutes left. If there's anyone that has a question, um, we can start right here. We got a question in the Harvard Graduate School of Education Student Law Society chat from IT's international student, and she asks... What can us international students do Thank you. to support this movement? This is my first time hearing about Leonard Peltier, and it's good that we're educating ourselves, but I feel like there's more that we can and should do. It's so upsetting to learn about this because it is so clear how wrong this is, also because in some political context, international students are voiceless. We all disagree with that, but that's what the question <laughs> says. But I'm sure there's something that we can do. I would... Um, encourage them to write a letter to the president and um, you know participating in, in voices like this if there's opportunities for op-eds and placement that continue to shed light on this and amplify there's often social media if you're in any sort of leadership position if you have opportunities to amplify the messages that that Indian Collective puts out, that Amnesty International puts out, that Illuminative puts out, all of these organizations that work together to provide social media really is that sort of noise, right? But letter, the old-fashioned letter to the White House, to the Speaker of the um, House of Representatives, well, Probably not going to listen to Speaker McCarthy so much. Maybe maybe Hakeem Jeffries, the leader Jeffries. The uh, and and uh, but the you know those voices matter. The chairman of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, Brian Schatz, is a terrific advocate in in support of freedom for Leonard Peltier, and him knowing our advocates knowing, just like Raul Garhalva in the House, that that they've got the support. Those voices, um, those are opportunities to weigh in. Thank you. Does anyone else in the audience? Uh, I think Erica Annabelle is passing over the mic. Thank you. So, so I feel like the new nightly news is like Netflix and HBO documentaries. And is there any uh, interest in the story by media like that? Uh, I, can, I can jump in. The answer, the short answer is yes. Um, you know, there, there was... Um, uh, gosh, I don't even know the year anymore. Robert Redford, uh, executive produced incident in Oglala. Um, a lot has come out since that time, but there are other documentaries currently in the works. I know there are um, uh, docudramas that are in the works, multi-series. Um, just how quickly can they get into the stream? But content, you know, all well, the streaming services are always looking for content, and this is just a story that's got everything in it. I mean, whatever angle you want, um, this story has, has got it. And, you know, we haven't talked much about this, but part of the danger is that Leonard is 79, and it's one thing to be 79 on the outside. It's another thing to have served, you know, 48 years in a maximum security prison and be 79 without the health care that's available. You know, he uses a walker. He's, he's partially blind in one eye. He's got diabetes. He's got an aortic aneurysm. But if that ruptures, there is no way that they save him. It's almost impossible to save somebody if they are in a medical facility. And certainly not if you're in a maximum security prison. He's still classified as max. And these places are dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he spends much of his time on lockdown. So he's in his 9 by 12 cell. But um, as, as someone who spent a lot of time in solitary uh, informed me when I said, well, this cell's, you know, 9 by 12. And he goes, yeah, but then you got to put beds in there and you've got to put a toilet in there and you've got to put a locker in there. And by the time you're done and Leonard and is in a cell points. with someone, he's got about three feet that he shares with someone else. Um, you know, that is, that is not an environment that is, you know, going to uh, increase your longevity. We need to get Leonard out now. 
You know what I, I will add to that is is um, those are severe and harsh conditions. We have visited him, and it was, it was it's shocking to see. But what continually um, surprises me and um, keeps me doing this work with so much energy is Leonard remains hopeful in a way that um, it. It, it is just remarkable after f this uh, nearly five decades in maximum security prison the whole time in these sort of conditions and he will call and you know I mean there are days obviously that he's down he's not feeling well but that hope that is still there it is it is remarkable to me and I think the thing I would add to that too is like his analysis of why he's in there he carries that. Like, it's not just, hey, I'm a victim, this happened to me. He's like, this has happened to Indian people everywhere, all the time. And, like, you know, when he talks about that, his, his, life, of his, his life is his Sundance. What he's talking about is, like, in, in Lakota ways, Sundance is about sacrificing. Right, you're sacrificing. You're giving back so that others may have life. And so when he references to the, his life as his Sundance, that's what he's talking about. And for, so for him to be there in, you know, failing health at 79 years old and still say, I'm doing this for the people. I'm doing this for the bigger cause. And I want to fight till the end. He could have, he could have, even if he didn't, he could have admitted that he did just to get out. He refused to. Out of principle. That one, he didn't. And number two, that he wasn't going to let, you know, his sacrifice be in vain. And so that's the other part that's remarkable about, you know, when you, when you talk to him. And he wants to be... He wants, to, he wants to interact with the movements of today. He wants to know what's going on. He, he freaking follows as much as he can, you know, from the inside. Um, and so, you know, people writing him, encouraging him directly, and anybody that's ever, you know, taken a stance when you've gotten letters, when you've been on the inside, it's a, it helps you get through. And uh, you can communicate from the outside too. So I would encourage that. Because I do think that helps him get to the, you know, gets to the next day, the next week too. And if, and if anybody wants to do that, go to the the Bureau of Prisons website because there are very strict rules on how to write to someone who's a prisoner. And uh, if you if anything is off, if the envelope is not white, it, they uh, they will not give it to them. So. Right, no, accountable. <laughs> so, right, Even so you just got to, you've got to, this is their rules. And so if you want to write to Leonard, just follow their rules. It's more important to get your words inside. I think we have a question from Beverly Smith here. Thank you. I have a comment. Um, I was thinking that one of the things I identified, thank you, identified uh, with, or I should say identify in the present sense, is that he's old, he's sick, and he's isolated. And I identify with all of those things, you know, trust me. But what I wanted to say, you know, really to the people, you know, here and who are listening, and also the people, you know, who are online, is that many of you here don't personally know about those experiences because you haven't gotten to them yet. You know, you're not, you know, uh, 76, you know, as I am. So the thing about it is that just try, try to find some empathy and identification with this guy. I mean, when I knew that he was sick, but when I heard that he had diabetes just you know, uh, now, mm -hmm. I thought, how on earth do you eat and live the way you're supposed to do and need to do if you're diabetic? 
I mean, diet is incredibly, you know, specific. Not only that, time of taking in food is exactly. important. I just learned that. Thank God I don't have, have diabetes, but I have scare. Um, but what I wanted to say, the time that you eat, the food that you eat, what time, what type of food you eat, and exercise. Yeah, exercise is very important for people who have diabetes. So just on that basis, and the idea of being sick, you know, in a place like that, it's just overwhelming. It's overwhelming. You know, just think about it. If you've ever been sick in your life, you know, chicken pox, whatever, whatever young people got. I know there's some diseases that I had that y'all don't have anymore. Thank goodness. But the thing is, just, you know, try and find those points of empathy. Because I think what that does is that it really energizes you to, uh, to fight. You know, I, I learned today, and to underscore your point, is that when the, the, these maximum security facilities, they already are understaffed, short-staffed, which causes them to go into lockdown where they're not allowed that sort of exercise. They're not allowed to go, you know, to, to eat, any of those things. But when the government shuts down, which it, it's really, it's very likely to do, it's really a question of for how long, they will be in lockdown that entire time because... They, they right? the guards are not determined as many of them as essential workers, and so they will be even more short-staffed. And so the second, um, you know, the stroke of midnight on on Saturday night, um, they will be in lockdown until until the government uh, reopens, and that is, you know, again, Leonard can't call then. He can't get emails. He can't call. So, you know, when we don't hear from him for. You know, we usually check in. Have you heard from him? Have you? You know, when it's been several days, you know, we know he's on lockdown. We were, but then we begin to wonder what, you know, is everything okay? Is it so? But know that if the government is shut down, they're in lockdown. So. Thank you. Um, well, and COVID is still out there. It's coming back. And so he's had it once. Uh, when I called trying to get a hold of him, they go, well, we've, we've put him in the medical unit. I thought... It was a medical unit. It's not. What they meant was we put him in a cell where he's isolated and they're not checking on him. And, you know, uh, it's just he survived it. But the odds were against him. And as COVID is coming back around again, if it was ever gone, you know, he is he is in danger. They're not. It was sometime we had to we had to ride them about um, getting booster shots for the vaccine. And as I'm on the phone with them, this is part of BOP, I'm asking about the, about the booster. And they go, well, you, you have to ask for it. And I go, okay, well, how do we ask for it? And they said, I kid you not, we cannot tell you that. <laughs> okay. Yes, our All right. pain system. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question over here. I, I want to also be mindful of everyone's time here today and that there is food outside waiting for folks that might be hungry. Um, and that I think we'll hang out for a couple minutes after for any last minute follow up. But we'll close with this last question. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you for that presentation. It made me very emotional. <laughs> um, I guess, like, I didn't know much about uh, this uh, campaign or this movement before I came here. Um, but when, when, when I do hear about it, when I, be, when I hear about the tactics used against the indigenous people in this country, it reminds me of a lot of the semi-colonial and fascist, I use that word very deliberately, tactics that are used against people all over the world who are fighting the military industrial complex yep. um, multi, and multinational corporations um, and the United States modern colonialism, which takes many forms and takes forms of semi-colonialism all over South um, South America, all over Africa and uh, Southeast Asia, all over the Middle East. Um, these are fascist tactics that are being used against the indigenous people. So my question for you is, as the Indian Collective, um, as you go against these fascist tactics used against your people, what are some key lessons you've learned to grow you and strengthen your movement in indigenous communities across um, the United States? Well, thank you for your question. Um, 
that list is long. I mean, I think we're, we're, <laughs> we're learning a lot of things. But the one thing that I will say that we absolutely use as a tool is our own media. Uh, we have a tactical media. Actually, Sherry is in the room here. Uh, uh, Lorenzo, Lorenzo, who's off-site but is in uh, helping bring this live. Most fascism has bought the media. So they control the media. It's part of their strategy. They control the newspapers. There's, you know, and the thing that I love about our creating our own media is we create our own media. There's no editing. There's no, there's no somebody who's telling us what we have, can and cannot say. It is our voice. We have to build our own platforms. We can use that for protection. So as, as much as, as much as um, tactical media is for getting the word out there, it's also when, when we're out there organizing on the front lines, it's protection for us. It's protection. They're helping us describe what's happening in those situations. Um, you know, the, the, the military industrial complex, they don't like cameras, right? They don't like being held accountable. All of our actions are nonviolent, direct action. Yeah, most, yeah. And, uh, so, and, and, and I think that, I think that, that, I think that that lesson is, I can't underscore that, that, that without that, I mean, this is our, this is dangerous work, period. But it's worth the, it is worth the risk because, because what we're fighting for. Yeah. Uh, but we have to produce our own media. I do think that it's important that you produce media when you're part of collectives though. Because I do think that when we just have individual platforms, then who are we accountable to what we're putting on those platforms too? The thing about building movements is about building, about, about having, being accountable to a collective of people that you are accountable to because that's how movements are built and that's how movements are sustained. The other big lesson I would say is the other side has billions and trillions of dollars that are being used to fight every single thing that we're doing every day. Our movements have to fuck with money. We have to deal with, we got to have politics about how we, how we handle resources. Indian Collective has raised $200 million since we started Indian Collective. And it's, part of the, and it's part of the organizing strategy, right? One, our movements need to be resourced. They, and they need to be resourced in a decentralized way. It's not about having Indian Collective be everywhere. I don't even agree with that. It is about having the infrastructure of indigenous self-determination supported everywhere in the, con the political and social context and climate of their communities, all the places that they're in. That, that is the infrastructure to sustain you know, movements, because the more decentralized, the more grassroots, the more powerful that the base is, the more powerful we are as a people. And so those are some of the, you know, some of the lessons. And to be honest, all of the work that Indian Collective does, all of it are lessons. All of that's based on lived experience. Indian Collective was not created in a think tank. It wasn't created by a marketing company. In fact, the marketing companies told me NDN, that it would scare white people, or land back would scare white people. And I was like, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> the marketing companies told me it wouldn't work, then shit, we're going to do it. You know? So the, I think you know, all of the things that we do are based on experiences, and we're continuing to learn lessons every day, all the time. Um, I think the other last like thing I'll say, as a person that's leading this organization who has faced political um, persecution, facing and facing, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm sitting up here. I mean, I'm facing 25 years right now for for my own political activities in my community. And is you gotta you gotta be prepared to use their system against them. They, they want to use the legal system to exhaust you, to drain you, mm -hmm. to distract you, to do all those things. So expect that shit and go and come to the, and come to the plate ready to exhaust them. 
So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much to the panelists. Woohoo! Thank you to my family in the first couple of rows here. Thank you to my friends in the back. Thank you everyone for being here today. Um, on behalf of NDN Collective, um, we thank you all. Thank you to our co-sponsors. Um, and I want to acknowledge, you know, while, while we're here on this campus, the history that's also taken place here. I would be remiss to not acknowledge the history of this university while we sit here before you and to also acknowledge how important it is and honestly how historic it is for us to be standing here on this stage and for me to even be a student here. Um, and I find it to be my responsibility to call out the history of this university and to bring forth the efforts of the freedom and the fight to free Leonard Peltier. So thank you all so much and free Leonard Peltier. Thank you, Celia.